Let's continue our study of the book of Philippians. We are in the first chapter. And let's start in verse 21 and a quick overview from 21 to 27. And then we'll start in the second half of verse 27 through 30. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's in a prison. He does not know whether he's going to get out or not. He hopes he gets out, of course. But he doesn't know for sure. And he surmises, just sitting there really kind of philosophically, existentially, if you will, that what's the most important thing in his life is Christ. And it is better to be with Christ than to do anything else in his life. And so to be with Christ is to live. And paradoxically, if he's dead, he's more with Christ than if he's physically alive. Because he'll be with Christ forever, and he won't have the power of temptation and the power of sin and the power of wrongdoing and the power of the world, the flesh, and the devil in his life. So he's in a lot better position. Many of you may find yourself in that situation. Oh, I'd be so much better off if I had passed away and I was with Christ and I didn't even have to deal with my sin anymore. Or there's maybe a person in your life that you want to have to deal with anymore or a situation at work or a situation in your everyday living that you prefer not. But really, Christ is more important to you than anything. And so your relationship with Jesus is so significant that you just want to be with him. All right. He goes on to say, I don't know what to choose. I'm torn between the two, he says. I I want to be with Christ, which is better, but it's necessary that I'm here for you, that I remain in the body. So, I'm going to remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, verse 25, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. So, the longer I am here, and the longer that I am going to be alive, you all are going to benefit. There's no question about it. There's no question about it that a holy, godly, righteous person, a person that has significant influence, a person that is in Christ, a person that's able to share that compassion and love and joy and peace and hope that Christ gives us for those who are in Christ, that's a beautiful thing to share with people around you. And people are blessed because of that. And I pray that's true for all of us, that your life makes such a difference that it would be terrible if you were to pass away. And there would be tremendous loss as a result of that because of your relationship with Christ and what you mean to the, to the people uh, in your life. So he says in verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. I don't want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on your conduct. I want you to focus with the way you're going to act. Now, The way you're going to act has to be equal to the gospel of Christ. So action is commensurate with or equal to the gospel of Christ. Let me put a big T-H-E there. Okay? Now that's pretty good summation, ladies and gentlemen, of the gospel of the New Testament, of what Christianity is about. It's about the gospel of Christ. Everything points to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And then people following him by repenting of their sins and putting their faith in Christ. By now following him after they've repented of their sins and put their faith in him, they are now going to conduct themselves in a way that brings glory to God, brings glory to Christ. Or we can say it in another way, they obey the will of God. They do what God says. All right, so let's pray that all of us can do that. Verse 27, second half. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, um, I, I may come and see you physically or I may just hear about you, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit. 
contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. I will know that you stand firm in one spirit. Now, this is the importance of the church and the church body and people in a community of faith standing together. There's not really anything in the scriptures that support a lone ranger mentality. The Bible is very clear in my view that the scriptures strongly support the community, the family, our relationship with Christ together, the church, the ecclesia, or ecclesia. We are together in the body of Christ and we need to stand firm in one spirit. So, the body congregating, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, the body congregating, being together, supporting one another, praying for one another, Holy Eucharist, Holy Communion, Baptism, Holy Baptism, sharing the message, defending the message, sharing the gospel, spreading the gospel, encouraging the gospel. That's what it's all about. That you will stand firm, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Back to the gospel again. The gospel is the only thing that can save us because it's the message which will save us. Now, any message that I have or you have, that won't save. Or any message outside of the gospel will not save. That's why the gospel is the message that saves. And that's the message that needs to be known, needs to be understood, needs to be believed, needs to be lived out. Contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, verse 28, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. You're going to get some op opposition in this world, folks. Not everybody's going to like what you say, and not everybody's going to like what you believe, and not everybody's going to like what you do. You're going to have opposing forces. Do not be frightened. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Do not give up. Do not feel that God has abandoned you. He has not. Why is there opposition? People don't want to change. They do not want to transform their lives. They do not want to submit to God Almighty. They do not want oh, God Almighty to tell them what to do. They want to do whatever they want to do on their time frame, on their checkbook, on their calendar, whatever they want to do. They will not submit to God. Do not be surprised when you talk about the gospel and the need for the gospel message and people oppose you. Do not be surprised. This is a sign to them. This is pretty strong. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. Now, when you have a situation where you have opposition to the gospel, you have a very, very serious problem. These people will be destroyed. Now, they may not be destroyed in this life, but their time will come to stand before God and give an account of why they oppose the gospel. That is not a smart thing to do. You do not want to oppose the gospel because why? Because when you oppose the gospel, you oppose God Almighty. That is not something you want to take on. Remember, Gamiel famously said, we might be opposing God if we oppose what these guys are saying in Acts when he stood up before the council. We might be fighting God, he says. You don't want to be fighting God. Now, that doesn't mean that people won't oppose you. But do not worry about the judgment upon them or the punishment or the justice or their accountability before God. God will take care of that. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Suffer for the Lord. Why is there suffering? Well, there's, that's a very big topic. But let me just simply say in the context of what he's saying here, those who oppose the Lord, uh, those who stand in opposition, 
that oppose you and me based on the gospel. You and I may suffer. It may be significant. We could lose our life. Acts chapter 7, Stephen. Acts chapter 7, Stephen. Or we may suffer much less, much less egregiously, if you will, but there may be suffering. We may lose our job. We may not get a job. We may not go up in the job chain. We may have people that will not speak to us. We may have people that cancel us. We have, may have people that speak ill of us. We might have people that disown us. On behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer Him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. You're going through the same struggles that you saw that I had. We're in this together. We're in this together. You're no different from me. I'm no different from you. The same struggles that you had, I have. So what do we have there? We have solidarity. We have an understanding with Paul and the people of Philippi that they're going through the same thing he's going through. Now, what happens when there's solidarity with your leader? Much more trust, much closer to the leader, much more caring for the leader, much easier to listen to. The person cares about you. The person, uh, the person values you. The person understands you. You're not out there just by yourself trying to figure it out. This person understands what you're going through and is trying to help you and is going to be there for you. This is a fantastic thing to hear from Paul. Paul is confessing where he actually is. I know that you will stand firm in one spirit. Do not be frightened in any way. This is a sign that, we, that they will be destroyed. It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for him. There's going to be suffering in this life, and there's no question. The amount of suffering, I don't know. Some or many of you may be dealing with that right now in your daily living in your stand for Christ, in your love for Christ, in their opposition to Christ. Remember, it's not about you, it's about Christ in you. They're not rejecting you, although that's what it feels like, of course. They're rejecting Christ who is in you. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. It's a very powerful sentence. You are going through the same struggle you saw that I had. You are now understanding, Philippians, what I have been through and what I am going through. I understand what you are going through, and we are together. We need to stay together. We need to stay together for the gospel. We need to take, continue to take action in the gospel. We need to continue to conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel. We need to stand firm together. There's going to be opposition. There is going to be suffering. There is going to be perhaps travail. There may even be death. There may be imprisonment. All kinds of things can happen. If you're a lone ranger and if you're out there by yourself, you don't have much chance, do you? You need the support of the group and, again, the community. Now, we're going to make a pretty dramatic shift to the second chapter. Remember, Philippians has four. One, two, three, four. Four, and we've just completed the first chapter, and I want to say a couple of things um, about the first verse before we look at it next time and return to it. This is extremely powerful, and verses 5 through 11 are very, very famous texts. We have much to learn in the next several verses. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, so, the idea is that you and I are united with Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is with us. We are in Christ. And that should be very encouraging. I hope all of you are encouraged by that fact in your life. That reality. Not a wish, not crossing your hands, not knocking on wood. It's a reality. You're in Christ. If you have any comfort from His love, I pray that all of us would have comfort from His love. That his love for you and me would go way deep down into your soul, way deep down into your body, way deep down into your mind, and that you would have tremendous comfort from that. You just could feel that coming upon you, and you would know in the core of your being,
Christ loves you. You're united to Christ. Any fellowship with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of your life. The Holy Spirit is guiding you and directing you and leading you. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit cares about you. He's coming alongside of you. He's comforting you. If any tenderness and compassion. We know what tenderness and compassion is. Mercy, tenderness, kindness, softness, if you will, compassion. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. You're joining with me. Some themes that we've said in chapter 1. You're being like-minded. We're coming together. Make my joy complete. Have the same love. Be one in spirit. One in purpose. That you personally are one in spirit and purpose, but collectively you are one in spirit and purpose. God can do a lot more through a lot of people than one person. You have a group of people come together and speak as one. It's very powerful. Not to say that God cannot use a person himself or herself for his honor and glory. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in the numbers of having people together, when we come together as a community, If that community is together in unity, in purpose, in Christ, have the same love, going in the same direction, it's a very powerful thing to see, to behold, and to be part of. Who wouldn't want to be part of that? Who wouldn't want to be part of a strong church family? If you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by doing what? Being like-minded. Think alike. Gossip, bitterness, envy, jealousy. That does not help. That is not going to help the community of God. That's not going to help the cause of God. That's not going to help the gospel of Christ. That's not going to move us forward in Christ. But if we are like-minded in Christ, not together in and of ourselves, that's not what he's talking about, of course. He's talking about being in Christ to do these things. Not outside of Christ, but with Christ. If any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness, any compassion, make my joy complete, be like-minded, having the same love. Again, we're marching toward the same thing. We agree on the spirit and the purpose of what we're doing. Now, you know, I find that people want to be in that situation. They want to be with people that are like-minded, purposeful, that they matter to the group, that they are significant, that they're contributing, that there's encouragement and hope. And you and I can do that in Christ. Now, our focus is not on ourselves. Our focus is not in exalting ourselves when we come together as a group. Our focus is on Christ and what Christ is doing in the group. Okay? So it's not a group of people out here that are just doing their own thing for themselves. It's a group of people out here that are in Christ. And they are doing Christ's will as one. They are doing Christ's will as one. And they are moving together in Christ. That is God's prayer for all of us. That is God's prayer for Paul and the Philippians. Paul is sharing that with us in chapter 2 as we open the second chapter together, verse 1. This is a beautiful prayer, verses 1 and 2, on how we should be united in the Spirit of God, in the purpose of God, and in the plan of God. Much to think about and pray about. Conduct yourselves, if I can go back to that scripture in verse 27, in a matter worthy of the gospel, we're sharing the gospel, and let's pray that we conduct ourselves in the gospel. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity to open the Holy Word of God in Philippians at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. Bless each of the folks listening today, and may we continue to act in a way that is according to the Word of God and according to the gospel that you have given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next time.